All right, so chapter four, um, I'm going to be honest with you. This is going to be the weirdest chapter we do. It's not going to be the hardest. It's just going to be the weirdest. Um, the one thing that I need you guys to do for me is to understand that even though it's going to look like a foreign language, in the beginning, by the time we're finished, everyone always says it's the easiest thing we do all year. I need you to just commit to understanding that it's going to look very weird the first few times you do it. But once you figure out the process, it never changes. And if you can count and read a periodic table, you can do this. Okay. The first part is the odd part that just doesn't make sense because we're going to talk about some things that just defy understanding and physics and, and all that crazy stuff. Uh, the back end part this chapter is where it gets a little odd. So let's talk about the, the weird part first. Let's go ahead and get this through. So what we're going to talk about today is explain the mathematical relationship among speed, wavelength, and frequency of electromagnetic radiation. We'll talk a little bit more about that more in depth today. We'll talk about the dual wave particle nature of light. That is the weirdest part of this entire chapter. Okay, But let's talk about what that kind of means. Now, what does dual mean? Two. It's not the guns and pow pow shoot each other and try to kill each other. Okay, It's not the old west. Dual means both. Okay, So wave and particle. So everyone take your arm and move it like a wave. This is a wave, right? Okay. Now, what are some things that travel like... <laughs> Hi! No, okay, wave. <laughs> That travel like a particle. Things that travel like a particle. Bullets, paintballs, baseballs, pellets, things of those nature, right? So, read this again. It says dual wave particle nature of light. So we've got to deal with both of those, things that travel like waves and things that travel like particles. Okay, so we've got to make sure we, we talk about both of them. Discuss the significance of the photoelectric effect and the line emission spectrum. We'll get to both of those a little bit later on. And then to talk about Bohr's model. Uh, and like I said, we'll get into all those things throughout this chapter. All right, so the first thing that we want to talk about is this word right here. Electromagnetic radiation. Scientists do a really good job of making things super complicated and making them sound really scary. When you hear the term electromagnetic radiation, that doesn't sound like anything you should be comfortable with. But in fact, what electromagnetic radiation is, is light. That big, huge, scary word can be reduced into one simple, very understandable thing called light. But here's where students have a problem. Kind of makes you, you are staying with this. Completely put all that up. Like, get rid of all of it. Thank you. Okay. We've got to make sure that we understand what light is. And here's the problem that high school students in chemistry don't understand. When you think of the word light, what do you think about? I'm going to give you some crazy answers here. Sun, energy, light bulbs. Those are actually reasonable. That's time I get crazy stuff. Let me sum it up in this one word, or this one kind of phrase. Something that you use to see. Is that fair? Something that you can see. Most people, when you see light, you think, okay, that's something that's visible to me. But here's the problem. In our world, and when I say our world, I mean in chemistry, you have got to come to the understanding in the grips that not all light is visible. Once you comprehend that, this will be so much easier. So from now on, when you hear the term light, you cannot automatically assume that it is visible to the human eye. Okay? And let me show you how we know that. And we're going to come back to this slide, but let's look at this. This is called the electromagnetic spectrum. Okay? So let's look at all of these things up here. And again, we just talked about what does electromagnetic radiation mean? Light. So all of these things are different forms of light. But again, you have to come to the assumption that not all of it is visible. So we've got gamma, x-rays, ultraviolet, infrared, microwaves, TV, radio, long, and AM radio waves. Can you see any of those things? Can you? Can you see a microwave? Can you see it cooking your food? talking about the actual microwaves that cook your food. No, you can't. If you do, that's really freaky, and I want to know what superpower you have. Okay. 
You can't see these things. Now, however, there's one part of this spectrum that the human eyeball can see. Which part of this? Visible light. This part that has this nice, beautiful rainbow shooting out of it. Okay. Now, beyond that, what part, or excuse me, how much of the spectrum does visible light make up of it? Very little, right? Okay. So you've got to come to grips with the fact that this is true. This entire range of electromagnetic spectrum, we can only see a small portion of this. Now, we can get into the discussion of what do dogs see and what do deer see and what do all these other animals see, but I could care less. I'm focusing on the fact of what is the spectrum in general. Yes, sir. Now, let's talk about that. What is heat waves? Where would it fit into this? Where would it fit into this spectrum? It's got to fall into one of these categories. Okay, So that's the point of perspective. I'm glad you asked that question, and we're going to get into that a little bit. So one of the follow-up questions I always ask in this particular section is, if we have a device, if we have a tool, could it allow our human eyes to see things outside of the visible spectrum? Yes, but can your eyes themselves see that? That's why you need devices and tools. Okay, And so gamma rays are kind of difficult to see, but is it possible to see the result of x-rays? Yeah, we've, some of us have had x-rays before. It's the result of. Now, can you see those things hitting your body? No, absolutely not. You need a tool, and that's what the x-ray machine can do. Ladies, ultraviolet, where can you see those? The cancer beds y'all get in, right? Okay. The cancer beds. Those, those tanning beds. An ultrasound. Okay. You did get part of it. Now, and, and here's the interesting part. Even though as, as wrong as you were, uh, it does deal with radio frequency waves. So what happens, but we're way down here on this end. So what it does is it shoots out beams of radio waves. Okay. So then we can get into ultraviolet. We can get into infrared. What are some things you guys, may, the infrared may be used for? Thermal stuff, security cameras, remote controls, all that stuff, right? So that's what the infrared, we know what microwaves are. You do not know pain until you eat a Hot Pocket straight out of the microwave. <laughs> yeah. All right. Stay with me. And then most of all of our favorites, TV and radio. So the crazy part about all of this spectrum is the fact of how vast it ranges. Now, I'm going to talk about the, the numerical ratio, the numerical aspect of this. We're going to talk about wavelengths in just a second. But let's talk about what all these numbers mean, okay? Whenever you look at a value that has an exponent that's a negative number, what does that tell you about that, neg that number? It's really small. So if you look way down here at gamma rays, which let's kind of talk about those. Where do gamma rays come from? Sun. Good or bad for us? Really bad. Okay, what protects us from them? The ozone, the atmosphere. Now, we've, we've done this before. Stay with me. Now, this says wavelength in meters. Okay, again, we're going to talk about what a wavelength is in a minute. But I taught you guys this. What it was the value of something times 10 to the third? It was 1,000. So, anything in the AM radio waves, the longest AM radio waves, you're looking at one wave is 1,000 meters. Now, that doesn't make sense. That's a thousand of these is one wave. Okay, but when you get over here and you're looking at gamma rays, they're times ten to the negative thirteen. So think about the difference in size of those two things. And we're not even at the smallest. The long radio waves, these are one hundred thousand, right? Times ten to the fifth is a hundred thousand. So one wave is one hundred thousand of these things. Exactly. So if you, if, and some, of, some of you probably never even hit the AM button on your radio station. But at night, you can hear stuff from like Chicago. You can hear stuff from New York because the waves are so long that they travel a lot further differences. Now, there's a difference at night because of the distortion in the atmosphere. There's a lot less 
radio traffic, if you will. Does that kind of make sense? There's a lot less impulses going out to block it. Um, but this is why you can hear AEM for a lot further. That's why whenever by the time you get to Troy and Montgomery, for sure, you lose a lot of the radio stations around Dothan. You get to Panama City, kind of the same concept. Yeah, and that's because of the diff the distances and the wavelengths. The longer the wave, the better it'll travel. Go ahead and ask your question. No, what's the, you're, you're talking about radio waves, the Wi-Fi signals. Which does anybody know? And this is a genuine question. Don't don't answer it out loud. I'm genuinely curious. Does anybody know what Wi-Fi stands for? Like for real? It's wireless fidelity. It's fidelity. That's what it stands for. And a lot of people don't know that, so that's something you can quiz the people. But don't worry about what that means, because that's what Wi-Fi stands for. Now, what Wi-Fi is is send out on specific radio frequencies. So you're looking somewhere in this range. Now, there's short band, which means they don't travel. Like if you know if you go outside your house, all, the walls obviously have an impact on that, but they're short band, which means they don't go as far. But they're impactful within the ranges of, of distances. Yes, sir. This is what I was just talking about. A negative exponent means the value is less than one, not zero. So it's a really, really, it's like a small decimal. No. Can we talk about that, man? That's what I thought. So let's talk about what a wave means. Now, there are two major parts to a wave. What are the two major parts to a wave? The top and the bottom. But this is important. So whenever we draw a wave, and again, this isn't going to be pretty. I'm going to just do my best. We know that there's a top. We know that there's a bottom. What is the top of a wave called? Very good. What is the bottom of a wave called? Trough. So we have crest and we have troughs. This is a very important question that's going to serve you for the rest of the time in here. Again, this isn't a perfect way, but I did my best. What is, the, don't say this out loud. Let me, let me kind of coach you through this. There's a reason why I'm asking. Is a wave from crest to trough, is that a wave? Okay. Or is it from crest to crest? Yes. So what we can say as that this entire length is what we call a wave length. But here's another important aspect to this. Is it always crest to crest? Is there an alternative? What? Very good. If it is a perfect wave, and mine is not, what should be true about those two lengths? They should be identical. Okay, They should be identical in length. Now, obviously we've already established the fact that do different waves have different wavelengths? Yes, these gamma rays are really, really dangerous, and they have really short wavelengths, and these radio waves are really, really, really long, and obviously they're not near as dangerous. We're being bombarded with them right now. If we had an FM tuner, could I scan through all of them and pick them all up? And we, I mean, they're constantly hitting us, but we don't even notice that they're there. It's weird to think about right now the amount of frequencies that's hitting us. We could go through this entire list and talk about the amount of frequency that's going on. Obviously radio, obviously TV, obviously Wi-Fi, which is also part of your radio waves. Should we be getting hit with some gamma and some UV right now? From the sunlight, I know it's not a lot right now because it's overcast, but there is still some coming through. Okay. And then obviously the big one is if we didn't have this, we wouldn't be able to see it all. So we need the visible light spectrum as well, which is what our eyeballs pick up. So I want to spend some time in the visible light range. I know we're not going very far in this, but I think it's important for you guys to understand the depth at which this affects us. Yes, sir. And see, and that's, that's one of the concepts I don't want to go too far because we could spend three days talking about 
what would it be like? And you can say, well, what are colorblind people? There's something wrong with their rods and cones in their eyes or the optic nerve that some part of this visible spectrum has been eliminated or cross-hatched. There's, it's a genetic issue, not necessarily a spectrum issue. It, and that's actually a really good question. If you could see radio waves, you wouldn't be able to see anything because there are so many of them. It would be complete. It would be. I don't know what color it would be. You can't describe it in a color, but it would be. Your eyes would be completely solid. Exactly. All right. So I wasn't going to do this, but I'll go ahead and do it. So one of the questions that I've already asked you guys. Guys, y'all are killing me. Y'all gotta stop. Please. Okay. Um, one of the things that I asked you guys, I said, if we have a device, if we have a tool, could we be able to see outside the visual spectrum? Now, everybody has probably seen the little light bulbs on all these into these remotes. Have you ever noticed, like, why is that there? It doesn't work. However, what frequency is this working on? It's, no, it's working on infrared. Because if I press a button, like I'm pressing one, can you see anything? No. But like I said, if we introduce a tool that allows us to be able to see outside of the spectrum, we should be able to, can I see? Ready, go. Okay, so it's obvious that this is now working. So you can actually see it, and does anybody have an older droid? Anybody got any droid at all? Can I see it for a second? This is, a, this is one of the new ones. Now I'm going to go ahead and tell you, if you go home with your iPhone, it's not going to work. Let me tell you why it won't work on an iPhone. The infrared spectrum, you can turn your camera on for me. Uh, thank you. The infrared spectrum in an image or a picture is called distortion, which is not a good thing, right? And so if you take this, which one is this, the 5 or the 6? This is the one I had, so this will work a little better. You can actually see, this battery must be dying, um, but you should see kind of a light bulb. The ones that, is your cam brightness, can I turn it up? There we go, that makes it. It's, it may be this battery. This battery is getting weak because used to when I did it, it was like a like a flickering light. It was really bright that you could see it. Thank you. So you could still see it. The fact is that the a tool introduced can show you the fact that you can't see it now, but it does work. Okay. So just kind of keep that in mind. So let's talk about visible light and what visible light is. Most of you have heard this before. Just like King Henry died as an acronym. Does anybody know the acronym for the rainbow? Okay. Now, I have sad news to tell you today, but it's not really GBIV anymore. They've taken his eye out. They've literally removed his eye. It's Roy G. Um, now, just like you can ask me, why do they keep taking Pluto in and out of planetary? They've removed Indigo. I don't know why. They've just done this. But there's something interesting about how Roy G. Biv, the color scheme, actually fits into the rest of the spectrum. Um, and, and I do find this really kind of interesting of how they set it all up purposefully obviously so we know it goes from red and if you notice something look right up here this is the end of red but notice what is right beyond that infrared now on the alternative if you look at the opposite we know it goes all the way up to violet and if you look at this part which is where violet is look at right there ultraviolet so that is, in essence, some of the connections that we can look at visible light and how it works. And I do want you guys to write this down. Um, write this part down right there. So if we take ultraviolet and we break it down into, and you know, science uses prefixes and suffixes and root words a lot, the term ultra means above or beyond. And ladies, you know this, whenever you get in a tent of bed, what color do those light bulbs look? A purplish violet, almost a white purple. In a, in a weird, strange way, it's a white purple. Say it again. It's not as efficient. I would definitely recommend wearing the glasses. Just take some cucumbers and put them over it and let it cook into your face. Okay. Now, so this is ultraviolet. The other one I want you to write down is this. So infrared, 
the term means below red. And so this will kind of give you an idea of how these four things, or really three things, infrared, visible light, and uh, infrared are all kind of semi-connected. And so it's the energy that's going to be here. Um, and again, there's two major things that connect this entire spectrum. And let's go back and let's look at this part right here, because I want to go back, and I know it's only two slides in, but light. We need to talk about how it travels because it's important. We're going we're gonna to adjust this, but it is important. So, and again, when you hear the term electromagnetic radiation, that's just a big fancy word for what? Light, that's first. And second, are, is all light visible? How much of it? Just a little bit of it. Okay. But it's a form of energy that exhibits what type of behavior? Circle or highlight that. Make sure you know that. Light can travel in wave-like patterns. So because we know it travels like a wave, there are two properties that we must know about a wave. And those two properties are frequency and wavelength. We've already talked about one, but we need to talk about the other one in just a second. Before I move any further, it says, Together, all forms of the electromagnetic radiation form the electromagnetic spectrum, which is what we've been looking at. Now, kind of a side note, this is really cool how it applies here at Northview. Um, what is our yearbook called? It's called the Spectrum. Our, what is our pageant called? Miss Spectrum. Well, the reason that the yearbook and the, the pageant is called the Spectrum because of the yearbook, but why is the yearbook called a Spectrum? The term Spectrum is more identified as a range. So you have a beginning and an end point, just like a school year. So that's why it's a yearbook. It is the spectrum of your year. So it's kind of cool how it ties all in together. Now, technically it's a tiny white lie because except for last year, the yearbook is the beginning of the year till the publishing cutoff date, but it is what it is. So here are the two things that we need to know about the properties of light. Number one, we've already talked about. There is one additional thing that we do need to talk about. First of all, wavelength is the distance. Now, when we're talking about distance, what is the metric unit for uh, distance? Meter. So we're going to be measuring things in meters. Now, obviously, instead of saying a thousand meters, what can you say about that wave? It's a kilometer. Okay. And, and some of you may or may not know this. Instead of saying times 10 to the sixth meter, we can say that's a micrometer. Or times 10 to the ninth would be a nanometer. So you can use those prefixes and move your decimals around, which is fine. The one last thing, this is important. Make sure you know this. The symbol for wavelength, do you agree instead of writing the word Fahrenheit, it's nice to write the letter F? Instead of writing this whole word wavelength, you can write the Greek symbol, which is lowercase, which is lambda. Now, I need to show you this, and I do want you to write this down. I don't care how you write it. You're going to see me write it one of two ways. You're going to see me write it like this way, which is just kind of a fancy upside down Y. But you are more than welcome to write it straight. You'll see me write it with a green circle around it. But that is what the Greek upside down symbol lambda represents. So in all of the formulas that we use, we're going to use that Greek symbol. Just like when you see the capital, tri the capital triangle, what is that? Delta. This is just lambda. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah. So we already know what wavelength is. Now we need to talk about frequency. This is, the, this is an important one. Because wavelength and frequency are related, and we're going to talk about how they're related. So frequency is defined as... The number of waves, I need to stop right there. Again, what is the definition of a wave? Crest to crest or what? I, if you don't know that, you may, is that how you spell trough? Okay, it just looks funny. So, one crest to crest point. So the number of waves that pass a given point in a specific time. Now, normally, we do this in one second, and here's why. And this is a trick question. I'm telling you now this is a test question because I get everyone every year. What speed do all, wave, all waves travel? That's exactly right. So when I show you this picture, which wave, the red one, the green one, or the blue one is traveling the fastest.
They're all the same. They all travel the same speed, which is the speed of light. We'll talk about that in a second. Okay. So, again, I'm telling you that is a trick question. Again, the symbol you need to know is new, and I make it kind of look a little weird. It's like an R with a long arm or a V, however. That's just how I write mine, lambda and nu. So don't freak out if you see something crazy pop up on the screen. This is what I'm referring to. Okay. Now, that last bullet circle or highlight that, you need to know what the uh, unit is. So if I ask you guys, what do you weigh? First of all, would you give me a number? And what would your American unit be? Pounds. Okay. So if I ask you, what is your frequency? Obviously, there's a number. And then what would your unit be for frequency? Hertz. And this is weird. You've probably heard this before, but you've never applied it to anything that you've ever done. If any of you are electronic fans, especially TVs, this is a big one for like the clarity of a TV. It's called a refresh rate. And it's normally used in megahertz. Um, and so that's just something that you can see, you've heard, but you've never really applied it to anything logical um, to whatever you've done. So this is, a, this is a picture. So we talked about wavelength. We've talked about frequency. And let's talk about the simple one first, which is wavelength. So what color wave has the longest wavelength? Red. Obviously because the distance from crest to crest is farther than either of the other two. So is wavelength very simple? You just find which one is longer. Frequency is a little bit different, and the way that I think about it I think can help. The way that I approach frequency is I do it in claps. Because you've got to remember, which wave is traveling the fastest? They're all traveling at the same speed. And we're going to pretend that they're all traveling to the right. Okay? And they have these things. They have these devices out there that they can put at the end of this wave, at, at all, the end of all three of them, and what they're going to do is they're going to read the wave as it travels. So, again, let's pretend that in one second this wave travels, and we want to know how many waves go through that reader in a second. So the way I kind of approach it is I say it's a clap for every wave. So the top one would kind of be slow. And then what would I have to do with the green one? And then by the last one? So auditory, can you hear the frequency change? Does it represent what we just saw comparatively? So doing it that way, which one has the highest frequency? The bottom one. Obviously, because you've got way more claps in a certain amount of time than you do the others. So that's how I kind of think about frequency. But can someone tell me how frequency and wavelength are related if that's true? Say, say that again. Perfect. The higher the frequency, the shorter the wavelength. So if one value goes up, the other one has to go down. So how are those two things related? indirectly or inversely proportional. Okay? So, let's talk about the math aspect of this, I think. Yep, this is the math aspect of it. Now, here's the good news. How many of you ever heard of E equals MC squared? We're not doing that. Who came up with it? What does it mean? Times. What is C? Say it again. Speed of light and speed of light squared. So this is a fact you guys need to know. C, the variable C, again, don't ask me why, stands for the speed of light. Now, is the speed of light constant? Please, I am begging you, please know this number and know that it is a constant. The speed of light will never change. So just like I've asked you a few times, which wave is traveling at the fastest speed? They're all the same. And they're all traveling how fast? 3 times 10 to the 8th, or in red, what is that value? 300. So this is where the physics part doesn't make sense. This is 1 meter. Imagine 300 million of these flying past your face in a single second. This is why it doesn't make sense is you can't comprehend the vastness of that. That's exactly right. 
that's in the uh, no, it's not the bulb. It's in the, there's a what's it called? The ballast. There's a there's something wrong in there. The the signal's there instantly. It's something wrong with the electrical kit. Yeah. yeah. We'll talk about the math tomorrow. Yes.